Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live as well as Danun Institute of Biblical Research. This video here is actually airing first on Danun Institute of Biblical Research. It is a prophetic segment of our broadcast here looking very deeply into what is going on uh, with this latest UN Resolution 2334 that has uh, effectively crippled Israel and not allowing them to build anywhere uh, inside of their country uh, is mainly because of the part of the West Bank and not only the West Bank but redrawing the lines based on the Oslo Accord that was signed by Shimon Peres. We're going to be getting into this but um, just for those that do watch our broadcast on Israeli News Live uh, when we air this there as well this is a very in-depth prophetic look on a biblical scale. Uh, keep in mind, some of those that do watch, they make the comment, you know, we don't come here for the religious side, but you have to understand Israeli News Live began as a teaching channel. More than about 70,000 subscribers came for that purpose. So we still look at things prophetically. And, uh, but I'll let you guys know, just in case you do not want to tune into this part of the, uh, the broadcast, uh, this article right here, Netanyahu blasts UN Obama over West Bank Settlements Resolution, is clearly uh, the king of the south pushing back at the king of the north. And uh, some may argue as to who the king of the north actually is. A lot of people believe it is Russia, it is Putin. I do not believe it is Putin myself. I personally hold to the idea that, that the king is actually the Pope of Rome who is running uh, his Roman soldiers and we can find this in the Apocalypse of Thomas, because uh, clearly the king of the uh, north uh, is a man that rises up out of the south. We could argue that being South America, where Pope Francis comes from, and he takes the helm in Rome, which would be the king of the north, the Roman Empire. And we're seeing a stage being reset as it was 2,000 years ago, when Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, was actually walking the streets of Jerusalem, where after the Maccabee revolt, uh, the, the fatal mistake Israel made was a covenant with Rome that in, es in essence brought a Roman government inside of Israel, and Israel began to lose power. They began to lose especially Jerusalem of all things. And so what did Israel do back in 1993 with the Oslo Accords, 1993, 1994? We saw that Israel invited Rome in, in all of her military might to go with it. The United Nations, uh, they did an Oslo Accord that effectively divided Jerusalem once again, thanks to Shimon Peres, and they gave Jerusalem to the Vatican where they would be the entity, the regime that will actually govern the old city of Jerusalem, or whoever they choose to have govern it. Let me make sure I make that clear. They could choose someone else, but as of now, we know for a fact uh, that they have allowed the Pope of Rome to actually be able to do just that. Uh, and, and I say this uh, because if you remember the, the mass that he held there um, in the upper room, he actually wears his triple crown, and this is something that was clearly showing who he is. Right here, pictured on your screen, he's got on his little crown. I call it the triple crown. I don't know if it's considered the triple crown or not, but it's still his pope crown showing that he is the king of Israel. That picture is taken right there inside of this room here where the pope was in the upper room there inside of uh, Jerusalem. It was men only that participated in this particular communion service 2014 uh, that was done during Passover uh, uh, not the Christian Passover, I mean the Jewish Passover, but the, the Christian uh, Catholic way of doing it there. And this was what was really fascinating is he fulfilled a biblical prophecy that most people overlook there. And there's Obadiah verse 16 where it says here, let me back up to verse 15. For the day the Lord is near upon the nations as thou hast done, it shall be done unto you. My, uh, your dealing shall return upon your own head. Now he's talking about Esau. We know this because of verse 6. How is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? His hidden places happens to be Rome. And we also know that because of the, the mere fact of the whole passage here. What does it say here? For thy violence done to thy brother Jacob, speaking about Esau, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that thou didst stand aloof, in the day that strangers carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them. All right, now, some might argue that this was during the Babylonian conquest. 
uh, but I argue that it was actually the Roman uh, conquest is what this is actually speaking of because it was the one time when Rome itself, Titus the Roman general, is claimed to have been, he stood, on, he stood aside while the Syrian military actually uh, destroyed Jerusalem and carried the things out. But it's Titus the Roman general that the Ark of Titus there in uh, Rome is built for, showing that he carried the temple artifacts back to Rome at that time. Now, there was no Vatican, of course, at that time, but nonetheless, it is reported that the uh, Jewish menorah that was there, the temple menorah, is actually there in the catacombs under the Vatican somewhere. Uh, that's been reported by a uh, uh, I think a Moroccan Jew who actually says he saw it when he was invited there to the Vatican many years ago, back in the late 1800s. Uh, anyway, as we go on to see, though, what happens is that it clearly identifies, like it does in Daniel, when it says the prince that shall come, uh, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, when the city and the sanctuary was destroyed in 70 AD, it was done by the prince of the people that shall come, the people that that, that did this, or the prince that shall come, was of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which were the Romans, Titus the Roman general, and again, of course, Syria. And why Syria? What does Syria have to do with this? As I stated the other day on one of our broadcasts here, Syria, just like 2,000 years ago, was conquered by the Romans. And when the Romans had conquered them, they rebuilt it, then they became basically another Roman city. And so therefore, they helped the Romans in 70 AD, some 25 years later, to conquer Jerusalem as well. NATO has been bent on destroying Syria and toppling President Bashar al-Assad and replacing him with their own king. This is why you see the Turkish army in there like never before, and even now moving more and more and more and more tanks and equipments in there. Just got another report on that today. They're even moving more tanks into El Bab, right there north of Aleppo. Why, why are they moving such massive amounts of troops there if Turkey's not planning on a major takeover of Syria in the very coming days? Which makes you wonder why was the plane really down uh, the Russian plane that was carrying all these people. By the way, there was a very important general on that plane as well. There is speculation that the plane was shot down. We'll go into that in a news broadcast. So anyway, what are we dealing with here right now? We are dealing with Rome once again and getting, getting in control. you got to remember, during the Maccabees, under the Maccabees, when they revolted against the Greeks, they overcame, they, took, they spent about 25 years warring. They got the temple back. We get the story of Hanukkah from that. And then what happens with the Maccabees later, as, as time goes down, they end up replacing the true Zedekite priesthood, and it becomes a Hasmonean dynasty instead, which was never God's intention. Even Judas Maccabee was a Benjamite, becomes a high priest of Israel, totally out of cater with God's word. But it's okay. Things happen the way they did. And then a, a covenant is made with Rome, and when they do that, the next thing you know, Rome slowly but surely takes over all of Israel, including Jerusalem. And of course, we get Herod the Great, who is an Edomite uh, from Rome, who ends up uh, governing all of Judea. That's exactly what we're seeing again today. We have an Edomite in the Vatican right now, Pope Francis, who, by the way, is a genuine Italian. His parents were Italian, even though he comes from South America. His parents were all Italians there. He is an Edomite, and he has been given an official seat there at the tomb of David as the king of Israel. And that's why I show you this picture here, showing you that he is sitting there up on top of the tomb of David in the upper room, which is directly above the tomb of David, wearing a crown, showing that he is, in fact, the king of Israel. So on that particular day, when that communion service happened, what do we have happen? We find out, starting in verse 15, sorry, I'm in the uh, room, I'm in the Micah 4, we'll get to Micah 4 in just a moment. Obadiah is where we need to be. We get down to verse 15. Uh, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. You have to remember, Esau is a spirit that is carried down and down and down. It's almost like the spirit of Moses and Elijah that will return in the, this day here as the two witnesses, which we'll be speaking about in this broadcast. Also, the spirit of Esau also has moved all the way down into the modern days because that's what the prophecies speak about. But this is when we see the Pope of Rome actually fulfills biblical prophecy when it says, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually, yea, 
they shall drink and shall swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. All right, what is this speaking about right here? It seems kind of, you know, vague here. But when you begin to look at this in the Hebrew language right here, Kika Asha Shudetem Al Hakodeshi, all right, uh, for, for as though when you have drank, uh, which is in the masculine plural here, Shute is for drinking, Dam is masculine plural with the mem right there, Al Hakodeshi. When you have drank upon my holy mountain, this tells me when I read Hebrew, that this is men only that are drinking in this communion service. Now, what's really ironic is that it was, as you can even see by the picture, it was men only. The very news broadcast put out by the official Vatican News was that only men partook in this communion service, perfectly in line with what Obadiah says right here. Shutetem al Hakodeshi upon my holy mountain. Now, this is another reason why we know this mountain is holy. For those of you that may not know, and I wished I had this up to show you, I did a special broadcast a little while back on, um, and I'll try to put this, I'll try to put images in here while I'm speaking about it. I'll try to go back and cut that into this video as well. Uh, outside what we call the Essene Gate there, which is upon this exact same mountain where the Pope is sitting right now, right in behind this facility here, is a place called the Essene Gate. Uh, it's the Essene Quarter. And it's the only active mikvah that comes up uh, as you're coming up out of the Hanan, uh, uh, Hinnom Valley, there is a mikvah there, and it's the only active one in, in, in Jerusalem that I am aware of to this day. It is even used by the rabbis there that live right there next to this place here that come to the tomb of David. And this mikvah is actually act, uh, active still, which also kind of tends to make me wonder if it is not truly the holy mountain that he's speaking about. And not only that, we also have St. James's Church just inside that gate as well. So, you know, the Pope knows good and well. They know historically what this really constitutes. But let's look else what it says in Obadiah here. It says, it continues to say, Ishatu kol hagoim, and they, they being both male or female, they, kol hagoim, all the nations, ishatu, and they will continue to drink, tamid, tamid is the word for continue, they shall continue to drink, the people of the nations, all the nations. This is actually referring to all the different churches. And sure enough, after the Pope of Rome had his communion service there, not only Catholics, but we had Greek Orthodox, other religions coming in, holding communion services, both in the upper room as well as actually in David's own tomb itself. All right, so this is the prophecies that we see are being fulfilled. Now, the point in saying all of this right here is to show, and of course, Mount Zion being that holy mountain, is that a showdown is about to take place. As we move down into this prophecy here, and we get near the end of this in Obadiah, we find in the, in the captivity of, his, of this host of the children of Israel that are among the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, and to the captivity of Jerusalem that is in uh, Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. But notice the captivity of Jerusalem. The city is actually under siege. And that's exactly what the resolution that is being played out right now that we find out that Netanyahu is fighting against is happening now. All right, they, he is fighting against the resolution that stops him from building inside the, the so-called West Bank. It's not just the West Bank. It's Jerusalem itself. It is since 1967, since Israel cap captured Jerusalem, he's building on land that Israel actually has now. And, but this was supposed to be international city according to Resolution 181. But even before Resolution 181 was put into place in 1947, and this is where I have to stand with Israel on this, and this is why when I say to my Arabic friends that, are, that, that don't like when I say this, you have to go back. When the World War I toppled the Ottoman Empire, the Jews had been, before the Ottoman Empire was toppled, the Jews had been buying up land like crazy inside of Israel. Uh, especially around uh, Joppa and Galilee, the areas like that, they were buying it up. Even after the World War I, they were still buying up land. But then the British got strong control under the influence of the Vatican, and they began to gain complete control of the whole area, and they stopped the Jews from being able to buy any more land. But in the 20s, 
This is when we had an, a, a resolution that was done by the then, before the United Nations got changed to the name of the United Nations, as the, uh, uh, back then, still the same thing, still the same group, but it was the League of Nations that did a resolution that allowed all the land of what we would call Israel today, everything west of the, uh, of the Jordan River in 1922, I believe it was, uh, of July, they actually had both west and east of the Jordan all the way to what is called modern day Jordan. But that changed six months later. They gave everything east of the Jordan to the Jordanians or the Arabs of that region. So even what we call Palestinians today are, the, are, are part Jordanian, part Egyptian, by the way, because there was a lot of illegal immigration that the British never stopped. But they stopped the Jews from coming in, but they never stopped. They kept uh, encouraging more of the Arabs to come in because Israel was not very much of an inhabited land. Very few Arabs lived there. By 1947, there was only a half million Arabs in the entire region. All right, and that's both sides of the river. So, you know, and they only had 80,000 Jews, but that was, there would have been more Jews had they not stopped them from coming in. They had stopped them from coming in. So at, at this point here, what are we looking at? What we're dealing with here is that it's a takeover. And we can see slowly but surely in time, the Pope of Rome using his Roman military, according to the Apocrypha of Thomas, by the way, I know some people don't like using books that are outside of the Bible, but I still think that it's important when we're looking at things in a prophetic uh, standpoint here, because the Apocrypha of Thomas actually says that speaking about before the Antichrist would actually come there, this king, this king that would rise up from the south, all right, he rises up from the south, but he's actually the king of the north spoken of in Daniel. But he rises up from the south, and what does he do? He will take and he will bankrupt the world's economy with his Roman soldiers. And then he calls for the redistribution of wealth, taking it from the elderly and redistributing it among the poor. Is not the Vatican calling for all of these things? Sure they are. But what has God got in plan? God is planning on an incredible thing, and that is... Even though Jerusalem is going to be under siege, he's also going to bring in the two witnesses. As we read right here uh, on your screen here, And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, why does he say that they will judge the... They're come up on Mount Zion, but it, they said they're going to judge the Mount of Esau. Because Esau has taken over Jerusalem. The Romans, the Vatican is that foreign entity that has gotten control. Now, they may say the Jordanians have it, but you will see, as you saw in the picture already, it's the Pope of Rome that sits there. The saviors or deliverers, uh, these deliverers could be another word you can translate this as, clearly are your two witnesses of Revelation 11. Now, I'm going to share with you some things that I think will really be a blessing to you. Before I go to it, though, let me set the stage a little bit. Micah 4 here. All right, because in Micah 4, we see, In that day saith the Lord, I will gather and assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that is halted a remnant, and, and her that was cast away off, afar, off a mighty nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. Now, that's kind of odd. Israel is brought home. The Lord is going to reign over them in Mount Zion forevermore. Then we're going to find out this, this, he brings them home, but then the story changes. All right? And thou, Migdal, Eder, the hill of daughter of Zion, and to all thee shall it come. Yea, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why dost thou crowd aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Thy pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. So Israel returns to her homeland only to be thrown into a major travail. And of course, the fascinating words that are stated here, is there no king in thee? You have to go back in the history of Israel to know what God is speaking about when he says, is there no king in thee? And that is because when, when Israel rejected the provided way that, 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 that the eternal father had planned for Israel, and that was that a prophet led his people. Samuel the prophet was the prophet then, and Israel cried out for a king, and the Eternal Father did not want Israel having a king. He wanted to lead them supernaturally. All right? And so what did he do? 
They chose a king instead. They got Saul, who was aroused about. Finally got David, a, a, a king after God's own heart. They got Solomon. Solomon ends up backsliding, etc. But the point was, as Israel left God's provided way of doing things, being led supernaturally by his prophet like Moses. That's why Moses even said, The Lord thy God shall raise up a prophet liken unto me. God never said he would raise up a king liken unto me. He said a prophet liken unto me. And then we get the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, HaMashiach. He was the one that was raised up, the prophet likened unto him. All right. Now, you know, I got something in the back of my mind. I keep thinking of uh, this little off track, but let me just throw it in here real quick. Somebody made a comment in the comments the other day because I said, if you really knew what gold was for and why they're trying to hoard the gold for, for these demonic beings and everything, then it make more sense. And a person asked a question on there, Steve, tell us what the gold is really for. I just want to throw one thing in here for you to think about. You remember when Moses took the golden calf and he broke it up, he crushed it into powder, then he tossed it into the river, and the children of Israel drank from that water? You would be amazed at how powerful gold can be for the human body. We are made up of electrodes inside of our body, right? Our, our nervous system is electrodes. We, they say, for example, if your blood is low in iron, you can get very, very sick. Why? Because iron is a conductive material inside of your body. Well, gold is better than iron. And it's just my own hypothesis on this, but I believe that when Moses threw the gold in the water, the gold was meant to be ingested, not make statues out of, but actually ingested. Okay, like collodial gold now, they make a, a gold in a liquid that you can drink, and it actually helps you. Why? Because it helps inside of your brain to connect, to connect it, and it will literally help both right and left side of the brain to work properly. That's why. I just threw that in there for you there. That does answer your question, but see, the, the Satan knows that as well, and don't think that they don't. They, hoard, they want that gold. I think they want it for statues themselves. But really and truly, and remember, the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness journey, their clothes didn't wear out, their, their shoes didn't wear out, and they didn't age either. That's another thing that a lot of people miss. They didn't age. The reason we know this is because Moses and Joshua both give the testimony that when they started the journey to the end of the journey, they did their strength, their nothing had not abated, not one single bit. That's why I think, that's my thought on it. I don't know. You can do some research on it, see what you think about it, but that's the conclusion I came to. And the reason they're clothes because they're washing their clothes in this water that has been impregnated, so to speak, with the gold that had been busted down to just like a fine powder. Uh, anyway, I thought it was interesting. Uh, anyway, let's get back onto this. I don't want to, because I know this is a lengthy message as it is. So, so he goes... Why do you cry out aloud to me? Is there no king in this? As our counselor perish? Well, the counselor, according to Isaiah 9, 6, is Yeshua. The, you, know, the, you know, the God would send a counselor. And yes, he perished. He was killed. All right. So they're in, a, they're in pain like a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For thou shalt thou go forth out of the city and shall dwell in the field. That's a powerful verse right there. All right. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city and shalt dwell in the field. What city? Zion, Jerusalem. So the prophecy here is saying that even though God has brought them back to the homeland and they finally get to Mount Zion, they'll dwell there forevermore, they're still going to be driven out to the field. Hmm. And now many nations are assembled against thee that say, Let her be defiled, let our eye gaze upon Zion. This is what's happening. This is what Netanyahu is up against right now. It's over the UN resolution. The nations are, their eye is there and it's upon them. And they're saying, let our eye gaze upon them. Let me get to the right one here. She's defiled. And let our eye gaze upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he hath gathered them as the sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and thou shalt devote their gain in the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now shalt thou gather thyself in troops, O daughters of troops, and they have laid siege against us. They smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Hmm. 
Could that be that something will end up happening to Prime Minister Netanyahu? I pray that it doesn't. Uh, but nonetheless, Prime Minister Netanyahu, if you ever listen to any of our videos, I do say to you, my brother, I, I, I do know who does. I know that Rabbi Yehuda Glick does listen. So Re, Re, Rabbi Glick, let me just encourage you as well, my brother, send this message over to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. They're going to try to target him because he's making this stand. And he truly is the king of the south. Let me, let me share that with you guys. All right, now that we're finished with Micah here, let me, let me move over there for that one there. Let's go back up to the Bible there. Let's go to Daniel because this is all these prophecies are playing in together. And again, I realize this is going to be a lengthy message, friends, but I think it's well worth your time. You don't want to miss this. I will also try to move this into a... Um, to an mp3 format and place it on our website write a short article about it on our website so that those of you that want to watch it in mp3 format you can you have to go down to verse 39 here in daniel and by the way daniel chapter 11 is a whole range of things that are happening all right and even daniel 12 daniel 12 that was supposed to be sealed in the end time the lord revealed it to me what it is and i can share that it goes along with this message even and he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god and whom he shall acknowledge shall increase wait a minute wait, that's not the one let me let me get the right place um we want where the king of the south pushes up against him let me just let me do it like this here king south pushes because i forget which verse it's actually in Okay. It's in verse 40. All right. We need to look at verse 14 as well in just a moment here. Let's go to verse 40, though. So, yeah, right after 39. And by the way, and, he sh and this is important even chronologically here. Not the whole thing is in chronology. It's like different spaces of time, but certain things are laying in there. And he shall deal with a strong fortress and with the help of a foreign God whom he shall acknowledge shall increase in glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price. All right, he shall cause them to rule over many. Remember the British Empire who is under the Vatican's rule, their allegiance is to Rome. And people might, I had one, a uh, man, very nice man, he wrote in there, I cannot believe that you would say that the, the, the British Empire is loyal to Rome when they will not accept a Catholic person, you know, in royalty. Well, that's true, but they're still loyal. Do the research, you'll see. And I, I, don't, I don't mean it bad by no means, brother. I, I love you and I understand that. But it's out there, you'll see that the, 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 that the British Empire is, is loyal and they pay their taxes to the Vatican. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Who? Push at who? That one that rules many of the lands. It's not just, believe me, Britain is, only, Britain is, the, is the leader, but America is part of that. Uh, most of Europe under the European Union, he controls a lot of that. Everything that that whole NATO force is behind, they're controlling it. So at the time of the end shall the king of the south, which is Prime Minister Netanyahu, and it could be a different leader still yet to come, but he's starting to show the colors. Because I began to wonder, would Netanyahu ever push back? Because he's been going along with everything they've been doing. But now he's starting to push back. So it's a good possibility that he's actually going to fulfill these prophecies here. So in Daniel 11, the king of the south shall push back at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and, he's, and pass through. Notice the word though here. All right. Uh, come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries. All right, now, let's look at it over here, real quick here. The Melech HaTzephon, the king of the north, Berekevet, uh, with, with chariots, okay? Uve Parashim, Uve Banayot, Rabaot, here it is right here, Berotzot. Berotzot is kind of, 
flip-flopped in the way they have it on here. All right? And he shall enter into the countries. Ubo Baratso. And he shall come, literally, and he shall come to many countries. It's not just Israel. It's all those countries around Israel as well. That's why we see the war on Syria. All right? So he enters in, he comes into battle, but it's a lot to do with the fact the king of the south is pushing against him. Israel will be next. All right? But what's going to happen as a result? I mentioned, I said we'd speak about uh, the 14th verse of Daniel 11 as well. Let me just real quick touch on this right here. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish a vision, but they shall stumble. Again, the king of the south being Israel. And it's obvious here. In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. All right? Also the children of the violent among thy people. We'll let you know the king of the south is of Daniel's people. It's kind of obvious right there. All right. Now this is worded a little incorrectly. Also the children of the violent, somewhat correct. Also the lawless of your people. Which is to marry, Hazon is to marry the vision. The lawless of our people, they're standing up against the king of the south, but inside of this king of the south domain, which is Israel, we have some lawless there that will actually want to marry the vision. What vision is he talking about? Daniel 9, 26. And we know it's Daniel 9, 26, because what does Pope of Rome just finish up? His year of mercy, right? Reconcilia reconciliation, all right? That's exactly what the Mechodesh was all about in Israel. It was a reconciliation for iniquity. And they were doing this big thing with the Pope of Rome. And how did it start? With the lawless of, Cho of Israel's people. The sons of the lawless of, his pe of, of our people, the Jews, made a covenant with Rome. And the first one was in 1993 with Shimon Perez, but it finally came to a full fruition in the Mechodeshit movement that, has hap that happened in Israel back uh, just a couple of months ago when we were there. We covered the story on that. We found out what it was really all about. It was to try to do what? Marry the vision to fulfill Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24, 25, and 26, specifically when it speaks about that they would bring about reconciliation for iniquity. They're trying to marry the vision. But notice the Scripture says, but they shall stumble, all right? And that's exactly what it's saying there. They shall stumble or they shall fall. They won't be successful in marrying that vision. Why? Because something's going to happen. Now, according to what we saw already in Obadiah, there's going to come saviors or deliverers shall come up on the Mount, Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. They're going to be successful in making it an international city, though. We know that by... Obed, Obadiah's prophecy here in verse 21. But the two witnesses come on the scene. Now Micah 7 gives us an incredible look into this. And I want to share that with you. This is something that the Father, by the Holy Spirit, revealed to me that is actually absolutely amazing there. I'm still battling this cold, so my nose gets irritating me here. I apologize for that. In Micah 7, I did not realize the significance and the power of this, but this is an amazing verse here. Let me, let me read to you the prophecy of Micah. Micah is not talking about himself in this, by the way, either. He is actually talking about Moses. I did not realize that at the first, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. The godly man is perished out of the earth, and the upright among men is no more. They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. We see this all through the Middle East. And, of course, it's being stemmed from that of the West. So, therefore, what we see going on in the United States has nothing to do but evil men that are in control everywhere. United States, European Union, the Vatican, you name it, it's nothing but a bunch of demonic spirits. It is truly the Illuminati in control of the entire world, and there is a division in that, and I don't have time to go into that right now because that would be a whole other message, but there is a division. Satan's kingdom is divided. 
Yeshua made the statement when they called him Beel, the chief of Beelzebub. He said, if Satan's kingdom be divided, I think that's in Matthew chapter 12, he said his kingdom cannot stand. Well, do you think that the eternal father ever intended for Satan's kingdom to be able to stand in the first place? No. So the only way for it to collapse is for a division to come. And when we see wars in ha that are happening on earth, it's because there is a war happening somewhere in another dimension or in heaven, as you, as you might say. And that's what's going on. They are fighting. And the elites that are in the world, you can even tell what side they're on. Trump seems to side with Putin. So those two elites are together. And that's why I say when I do the news broadcast, it's not that I'm a lover of Putin. I'm a, I do love the Russian people. But the thing is, I know that the leaders of the world have all been appointed by Satan. So voting really does you no good. If Satan takes Yeshua up, Jesus, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world that ever will be and all that ever were, and says, these are all mine, I do with them what I want, I'll give it to you if you fall down and worship me, Jesus never argued with him over the fact that they were his. So those people in power, outside of those that were, that were brought in in Israel under the prophets and everything, are all demonic. All right? So what good does it do to vote? And people really believe that Donald Trump is going to do good. Donald Trump is another elite. I wished he was a godly man. I know that a lot of people think he is because Kenneth Copeland prayed for him. Kenneth Copeland is so wrapped up in with the Pope of Rome. You're, you, you know, he is nothing but a Vatican puppet and he takes and prays for the man a Vatican puppet does. I'd be afraid to know what kind of spirit got on him under, under the influence of Kenneth Copeland. All right? Now, I appreciate Donald Trump and the fact that he, he doesn't want to have war with Russia. And we realize no matter who gets into power, there's always a trade-off of something. So I appreciate that about Donald Trump. I'm not just here to throw Donald Trump under the bus. All right? But I'm just telling you, don't put your trust in a man. Because he will bring you to a disappointment. You keep your trust in Yeshua. Keep your trust in the Father of all. Not in a man. All right? Their hands are upon that which is evil to do it diligently, and the prince asketh, and the judge is ready for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth the evil desire of his soul, thus they weave it together. That's what they're doing. The best of them is a briar. The most upright is worse than a thorn hedge. Okay? The most upright is worse than a thorn hedge. So Donald Trump, even though he may seem to be the best one out there, is worse than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman, even thy visitation is come. Now shall there, now now shall be their perplexity, and they are perplexed. Trust you not in a friend. Put you not confidence in a familiar friend. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's enemies are the men of his own house. We're not seeing that in this day more than ever. I, I know I've seen it. I'm telling you, I've seen it myself. But as for me, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, though I am fallen, I shall arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light unto me. Many people think this is Micah. It's not Micah. Micah is literally writing about Moses, and you're going to see it in a moment. I believe you'll see this. Notice what he says. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I am fallen, I shall rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. When Moses, not the first time, God commanded him the first time, take the elders of Israel out there with you and go smite the rock that it bring forth its water. That was a prophecy about Yeshua. And it was so. The high priest with the elders of Israel, they smote Jesus. Didn't the guy take him, smite him on his face? Said, prophesy to me and tell me which way the devil went. When they smote him, though, when that final smoting, by the way, was done by a Roman once again. That's why Rome's got to be there today, and Rome's going to govern in Israel. Don't think they won't. They will. When they pierced his side, it brought forth the water. So it took, it ha Israel had to do it. 
It's the only way to bring forth that water. Moses had to smite the rock, had to have the elders, and they judged it, they smote the rock, and the water came forth. But if they didn't drink the water, they died. It's the same thing with Israel today. You'll either drink the water that comes from the true rock, the true Messiah, or you'll perish. If you want to drink the water from the rock that was not smitten, so from some pope of Rome that they put there in Israel, or better yet, some alien god that they know that they got coming, some demonic being. When I say alien god, remember, that's a devil. That is a devil in a, in a, in a, that has taken on, that has made some kind of corrupted human flesh out of it from more than likely from a clone of DNA that they've made for a body to live in, and he comes down here on this earth and sits in Jerusalem as your king, and the Pope adorns him and baptizes him as he promised that he would, there's going to be your true Antichrist. Israel, are you going to fall for some nonsense like this? I sure pray to God that you don't. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, though I am fallen, I shall rise. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Because the first time God told him to smite, the second time, 38 years later in the wilderness journey, according to the rabbis and laying out the time frame on that, God says to Moses when they're thirsting once again and they're crying out in the wilderness, we're dying out here of thirst, why did you bring us out here? He says, go to the rock and speak to the rock that it bring forth its waters. See, Yeshua was only to be smitten once to bring forth the waters. The second time you're to speak to him. Let me tell you why it was a fault of Moses. Because in this day here, Moses, that spirit of Moses is upon a man is going to be in Israel, and he's going to speak to the rock. And when he speaks to the rock, the waters of God will fall upon all the children of Israel that have ears to hear and eyes to see, and then they will believe. That's why in type, Moses was not to smite the rock because it was speaking of his second coming when he would come to this earth again. He won't have to smite the rock, Yeshua. He's going to speak to the rock in a word of prayer before the Almighty God, and the rock will actually bring forth its waters on Israel to be able to recognize their Messiah, the filling of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that until now. I have sinned. So he sinned because he smote it. He wasn't supposed to smite it because it's in the second coming. He won't smite that rock. He will speak and it will bring forth the water. Until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me, he will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Do you know when that was fulfilled? When he stood there with Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. And that's how you know who the two witnesses are because according to Revelation, when it speaks of, John writes about the two witnesses that are coming and one has the power to turn the waters to blood, the other one to, to bring fire down out of heaven and, or, and stop the rains and all these things here. It's Moses and Elijah's ministry, but it says these are the two olive branches on either side of the golden lampstand. Well, we know that Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, was indeed that that golden lampstand wrote, written of in Zechariah, right? And so here he is on Mount Transfiguration standing there, and Moses and Elijah on either side, the two olive branches were standing on either side of the golden lampstand. Is that not right? He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. So Yeshua was brought to, I mean, Moses was brought to Yeshua right along with Elijah, and he got to behold his righteousness there on Mount Transfiguration. Then mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her, who said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall gaze upon her. Now shall he trodden down as a mire of the streets. Now, this is a little difficult one here. Where, when they said, where is the Lord thy God? In David, we find David speaks in the Psalms that they said they would say that about him. Where is the Lord thy God? And that's what's going to happen. This is actually a prophetic event. They're going to say, where is the Lord thy God? Moses will speak. And then he'll, then he'll come. He'll speak to the rock at that time. The day for, for building thy walls, even that day shall be far removed. You know, I wondered for a while, what does that mean? The day for building thy walls, even that day shall be far removed. When Israel was building the wall to separate the West Bank from Israel, to separate it from the lands that they had, it would be far removed. They, far, they have long since ceased building that wall. You won't need it. You won't need it. 
Now, now we go into the prophecy of what's going to happen that's already fulfilling now. There shall be a day when they shall come unto thee from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt, from, and from Egypt, even to the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Moses, Micah is prophesying that they're going to come from Assyria. How would they be able to come from Assyria? Assyria, by the way, is modern-day northwest Iraq and modern-day Syria because the United States and NATO allies, Turkey and all, and even, even those that are backing Russia to help uh, President Bashar al-Assad, we're talking about Hezbollah, Iran, all these groups are inside of what they call Assyria, Syria and northwest Iraq. That's the ancient Syria, city of Assyria. So they're going to come from there because they already got their forces there now. They're going to come from Egypt because Egypt is going to cave into their demands. Even though Egypt tried to stop and because, you know, Donald Trump said, please don't do that, you know, but they caved in and did it anyway. So they're going to come from Egypt to Israel. They're going to come from the sea to Israel. They're going to come from the mountains, which is Jordan, Saudi Arabia, down there on the bottom end there. We got to come over the mountains to get to Israel. They're going to come from every direction to enforce the fact that the UN made that resolution. They're all going to come against you. All right? A lot of things going through my mind, guys. So, and the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because of the fruit of their doing. Now, I believe that that is a prophecy dealing with Syria, but it could have a twofold meaning as well. I think that deals with Syria, though, mainly, because it speaks they come from Assyria. And that's how the land became desolate. And remember what we saw over in Daniel 11 just a moment ago. When they come in at him, let's jump over to Daniel 11 here. Go back down to verse, what was it, 39 and 40. All right? Remember, in the time at the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow, and as he passes through... Well, many countries. It is Aratzot. They are Aratzot. That's countries. All right? And he has. He's taken out Iraq. He's taken out Syria. And now he's going to enter into Israel. And again, you see by the ships, you see by horsemen, which perfectly lines up with the prophecy that we're looking at over here. And in, uh, in, uh, where were we at here? In Micah, chapter 7. They come by sea, by land, by Egypt, by Syria, by mountains. It's all laying in there perfectly. Now watch what he says, though. This is what gets interesting. Tend thy people with thy staff. I want to show this one to you. Tend thy people with thy staff, the flock of thy heritage, that dwell solitarily as a forest in the midst of the fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, as in the days of thy coming forth out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him marvelous things. Show unto him marvelous things. I will show unto him marvelous things. Moses. Tend thy people. That is the key right there. Shepherd your people with the staff of your lineage, of your genealogy. Remember when I shared with you guys recently from the Apocrypha of Moses? where Moses comes to Joshua, the son of Nun, and he says to him, take the books that I have written and hide them in an earthen vessel that was made from the foundation of the earth. The earthen vessel is his body. When, when Joshua read those words, they became engraved on his DNA. So when Joshua's son and next son and next son and next son was born, that was passed down from generation to generation. Shepherd your people with the rod of your genealogy. The true words that were spoken by Moses 3,500 years ago are in the DNA of his own descendants, of Joshua's descendants. Joshua took the place of Moses. I believe that we're going to see a mighty move of God through a human being 
one, the two witnesses, I believe, are the descendants of Elijah and Moses. And it could be that of Joshua, either one. Because Moses commanded Joshua to put these in here. But Moses had two sons as well. And it's on their DNA. They're going to wake up to who they really are. They're going to find out who they really are. And then something incredible is going to happen. Watch what he says here. It gets better. Now, he says, I will show unto him marvelous things. Let's look at Exodus 34. This is a prophecy that has never been fulfilled. And he said, if now I have found grace, this is Moses speaking to the Eternal Father. If I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I, this is the Father speaking now. Behold, Behold, I will make a covenant before all thy people. I will do kol amcha ose nifalot. Do you realize what he's saying right here? Many of you know you don't. I apologize. And I apologize for not being able to do Hebrew lessons that I said I would do. I'm, I'm, I'm so caught up with so much, guys. Kol amcha os, excuse me, eso ose nifalot. I will create wonders. Not I will do marvels. I will create wonders such as have not been wrought in all the earth nor any nation and all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you that it is tremendous. The rabbis actually changed it to marvels because they, they said you know, Moses never did anything greater than the parting of the sea. But the thing is, the prophecy is saying that Moses is going to be in the land of Israel when God has already said that he couldn't go because of where he sinned at. And Micah tells us that, yes, he sinned. Micah says he sinned, and not only that, he would wait until the day of his, till, to the settlement of his judgment there. That's what we saw. Where, 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 where was that? It's in Micah 7. But let's go back up real quick, right? All right, and he says, um, As for me, look upon not look not upon me. I will wait until God of my salvation, my God, will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I am fallen, I shall arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light unto me. Micah is prophesying of the return of Moses. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause. Right? So in Exodus 34, God said that Moses couldn't go in the promised land because of that sin. Moses is waiting for God to, 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 to settle that debt right there. He said, I, will, I, I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and shall behold his righteousness. He goes on man transfiguration. So God has forgiven him. He knows he's there now. Then my enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her who said unto me, where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall gaze upon her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And by the way, Moses was the very one that said that if you destroy this people, they will say, where is that God that, 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 that delivered them? That's what the prophecy is speaking about. Not over in David. It's not from David. It's because they said that the children of Israel being wiped out, it's a future event where they're going to try to wipe out Israel again. And they're going to say, where is thy God? Well, he's going to show up with an uh, incredible power there. Exodus 34 says that he'll do, he'll create things. And not only it says, Observe thou which thou which I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest, lest they be a snare in the midst of you. He's not to make a covenant with them either. Now, in Micah 7, then my enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her. He said to me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall gaze upon her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. That's talking about Rome. The day for building thy walls, even thy day, shall be far removed. There shall be a day when they shall... Okay, we already know that. I'm sorry, I already read all that to you. Now, let's get back to this. After he's told to tend, tend his people with the rod of his heritage, his DNA, 
it shows that it's not the mate, the stick that he had when he came out, but this time it's inside of him. Remember what, it, what was written in Deuteronomy? The word of God is nigh you, even in you. It is on your lips, in your heart. It's in your DNA. That's not just Moses either. That's all of us. All of us that were there, that your descendants of your family is there, you're there. That's why he's waiting to wait. You're waiting for God to wake you up so you'll know who you really are. Israel is waiting for God to wake her up. Why do you think that the Bible says they, they, you know, he says prophesy to the mountains and to the rocks? Do you know the most powerful thing that holds memory better than anything is a crystal? They, the other day I saw on, online, they took a crystal, little tiny flake, the entire Bible was downloaded inside that crystal. Jesus said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. Rocks are scientifically proved, proven to be living. They sh now watch what he says. The nations shall see and be put to shame for all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. What's this man with his staff inside of him going to do? So all you guys running around with sticks in your hands thinking you're Moses, by the way or Elijah, either one, it has nothing to do with a stick in your hand. The rod is within you. So if you've been running around with a stick in your hand thinking you're Moses, it has nothing to do with it. You've been deceived. And believe me, there's many people that think they're the two witnesses. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling thing of the earth. They shall come and tremble out of, their, out of the closed places. They shall come with fear unto the Lord our God and shall be afraid because of thee. Who is God and liken unto you that pardoneth the iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will again have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt show faithfulness to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, as thou wast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Friends, we are at the door of this prophecy. The king of the south is pushing against the king of the north. Moses and Elijah are about to appear for support. We do need your help in making these broadcasts possible. Would you consider giving to the Denon Institute? If you choose to mail it, in fact, I've not been to the post office in a couple of weeks now. I have a lot of mail still to catch up on that we've not had a chance to answer. We thank those of you that have supported this work and continue to support this work. Um, pardon me for my slowness, slowness in getting back with people. I try to stay so much focused and study that it, it takes time. We thank you for your support and your kindness. IsraelReturns.com for Duden Institute and also IsraeliNewsLive.org. Both places have a, a, a link where you can donate online if you so choose to do so. Thank you for watching, Sean.